looks like we're live. Hello and welcome to this Independent Consulting Manual Roundtable discussion. Our topic today is hiring and firing clients. I'm your facilitator and in just a moment our esteemed panelists will be introducing themselves to you. I think you're going to find this topic extremely interesting. There is just so much raw, uh, like real-time emotion involved when it comes to hiring and firing clients. Uh, to paraphrase the old wild world of sports intro, it's the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, the human drama of hiring and firing clients. Each of our panelists has a wealth of experience and hard-won lessons on this subject, so pay attention for the next uh, 40 minutes or so. It'll be solid gold. My name is Philip Morgan. I help custom software development shops get more leads without hiring a salesperson. Again, I'll be your uh, moderator for this panel discussion, and let's uh, let the panel introduce themselves. Jeremy. Uh, hi, I'm Jeremy Green. I'm a uh, software architect. I specialize in Rails and uh, JavaScript applications for e-commerce and SaaS applications. I'm hi. Kat. I'm Kai Davis, an outreach consultant. I work with experts, authors, consultants, and coaches and help them manage their most valuable relationships and build new ones. Kurt? I'm Kurt Elster, senior e-commerce consultant who helps Shopify store owners uncover hidden profits in their websites. Michael? I'm Michael Steele. I'm the better half of MemberUp. We help uh, membership sites and any, any business that's got a, a subscription product. Travis? And I'm Travis Northcutt, and I'm apparently the lesser half of MemberUp. And I uh, do exactly what Michael said, but not quite as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, the benefit of going first, right? So you have all, I, in you know the past year or two, started getting significantly more leads coming in. And so I'm curious what has changed and how you bring on new clients as a result of that increased volume of, of new leads. And, you know, the way we'll do this, just anybody who feels like it can pipe up and we'll take it from there. The first thing that's been most impactful for me is really implementing a qualification and qualification process and almost viewing leads that come in as needing to score, starting at a base of, let's say, 30 points. They need to reach 100 for me to want to work with them. And if they can't reach that threshold, I push them towards another product, another service offering, or say, you know, we just don't seem like a good fit right now. But as the lead volume has increased, it's become more and more important for me to both better qualify the people and become more comfortable with saying no when somebody shows up and says, hey, I want to pay you a couple thousand dollars. Well, if they aren't a good fit, it's just not going to be a good working relationship. You know, it sounds like the way that system is constructed, it almost assumes they're not going to be the right fit, and you have to they have to sort of earn their way over that threshold by, I mean, how do they do that? How do they get over that threshold? Uh, what I do is I send them a series of qualifying questions when they first contact me, just so I can learn more about their business. If they pass that first check, let's say they scored 10 or 20 points on that, then I'll get on a phone call with them for 30 or 60 minutes, and the entire purpose of that phone call is just for me to learn more about their business, asking them questions about their goals, what outcomes they're searching for, writing down the notes, asking them why they contacted me compared to someone else, and from there, I'm able to determine almost diagnostically if I could help them grow their business. So I'm asking them questions, almost putting them on the stand and interrogating them to see, well, can I actually help them, and if not, how do I direct them to someone who can? Why interrogate? I'm curious. Uh, because I think most people show up to work with a consultant with a strong idea of what they want, but a very vague idea of what they need. And it's only by taking the time to really specifically ask them questions about their business, their goals, what they're trying to accomplish, uh, uh, why they want to start now compared to six months from now, why they didn't start a year ago, that I'm able to understand the root need behind the want. When I've done SEO consulting in the past, people show up and say, I want to be number one on Google, but being number one on Google doesn't put more money in your bank account. So it's only by really asking specific questions to understand, oh, we want to double our sales, that I'm able to understand how I could help them or if I could actually help them. Mm. So you're jumping into that. Well, I think what we're seeing there is the difference between freelancer and consultant. So when someone is approaching a freelancer, they're prescribing a problem. And then you know a consultant sees that as 
you know, for the, the problematic prescriptive system it is. You know, you wouldn't go to a doctor with a broken leg and show up and say, I need an x-ray. You'd say, I think I broke my leg. You know, and I think that's um, uh, that hazing process that we're using to qualify people is really just to try and break them of that um, that prescriptive approach and move them back toward that that relationship that you would have with a doctor. You know, where you're presenting, they present the problem and you prescribe the solution. Um, you know, I do it. Uh, a I don't do it quite as uh, quantitatively. You know, there's no lead scoring system that I use. Um, but what I do do is um, you know, similar, haze people, you know, I ask them questions, qualifying questions, you know, and it's just like three simple questions, and then based on that, I know, can I help them? And then I also know, you know, is it an exciting client? Is it an exciting project? So I just do a gut check, and that gut check, you know, if they if they pass that gut check and they have, um, you know, it looks like a project where I can be of service, then I'll move them to you know, the last step of that qualifying process, which is, let's hop on the phone for 15 minutes. And I just want to talk to the person and see if our personalities mesh and sort see if, you know, are they capable of scheduling and meeting a 15-minute phone meeting? You know, something else that's I think is really important, but it's really hard to do if you don't already have a lot of clients coming in is um, qualifying them based on a personality fit, uh, and if they're the type of business, if they're the type of person that you're going to be excited working for, because you can qualify their business, and if you'll be able to help bring them a return, or that they even have the infrastructure to, to have you, but also, and this is hard to do, but qualifying their personality, and the, the fit between you and them and, and making sure that that's going to be a good, healthy relationship and not something that drains you every time you're working on on their company, on their stuff. Um, Michael, how, how did you build that, that FBI personality profile that you use for <laughs> determining fit? You know what I mean? Yeah. It, um, I, at some point, when, when Travis and I decided to, to niche down into membership sites, we were really intentional about, all right, who is our ideal client? Not just based on the type of company they are or, um, you know, the, the revenue that they have, but also the type of person that we'd be dealing with. And we had enough experience um, getting into some bad relationships that we kind of knew what those red flags were going to be. So we had we had sort of a, a, a running list of things that we thought this would be, in terms of personality fit, a good client for us. And we don't always hit that mark. We Sometimes it's just really hard to feel that out, especially in the early conversations. But um, it's also something to, I think, is important as you're going through the project is assessing is this something that is energizing us is this something that is draining us every time we're having to work with them um, are we excited about working with them because if it, if it enters into that sort of poisonous relationship you're in trouble um, you know one of the things yeah. that I'm curious about is um, some of those unpleasant aspects of uh, client relationships don't really emerge until you're in the project do any of you have ways of sort of sniffing those out before the engagement begins. You kind of create some artificial situation to see if people are going to be, you know, say, timely in, re in their response to emails or, or whatever it is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one thing that Kurt said is, you know, just if that person can schedule that 15-minute call and, and stick to it, or if they have excuses or if they're late and don't respect your time. Uh, but another way to, to that I've found that really helps with that is to start off an engagement with some smaller project. So breaking it down into, you know, the smallest chunk, the smallest way that you can help them right now. Um, you know, if somebody comes to us, you know, we do membership stuff, and that could be, you know, somebody is migrating from this old, you know, this old outdated platform to this new one, and it's going to be this huge project uh, that could be easily five figures and take months to do. But um, that's a lot to jump into and to commit to for, uh, for us. It's a lot for them to commit to financially. And then uh, it's a lot to commit to in terms of relationship. And so an easy way for us to deal with that is to say, hey, look, let's let's start off by just kind of mapping this out. So we do like a road mapping phase um, where we'll say, okay, let's look at your needs, your current situation, what all your options are, and we'll just put together a report. So we're not going to do any of the technical 
uh, you know, the nuts and bolts work right now, but we're going to give you something that says, here's what you need, here are your options, and here's our recommendation or multiple recommendations. And we can do that at a, you know, far lower than the overall cost of the project to them, and that gives us and them a chance to see what that personality fit is like, and if, if we like working with them, and if they like working with us, and then, it, you know, the the besides the personality stuff, that's going to uncover any hidden, you know, kind of roadblocks and, you know, just in the technical implementation phase uh, that that we neither of us could see coming before that. And there have been multiple times where we've we've taken on a project like that, where we've done the road mapping phase and said, hey, he, you know, here this is, and internally we're saying we're gl we're really glad that we we limited this to just the road mapping phase. We don't want to work with this client either because of the relationship, just personality doesn't mesh, or honestly they're a toxic client, or even if it's just now we've uncovered some deeper stuff about this project that we just don't want to do, uh, that it wouldn't be rewarding. You'd have to pay us more than it would be worth you know, to, to put ourselves through that, um, the drudgery of that. And so we just say, hey, here's our recommendation. We're not a good fit right now. And we do that in a polite and respectful way. Um, you know, we say either we're not a good fit, there are other people who would be better at this work than us, or there would be people who can do just as good as us and they're cheaper, and so you'd get a higher ROI, um, or we're too busy for this in the time that you need, you know, whatever the case may be, we do that in a, in a polite and respectful way, sure. but that lets us, you know, disengage um, in, a, in a healthy way and not have to go through that, that you know, uh, uncomfortable, long project. Yeah, Travis makes some good points there. The um, I straight up tell the client that's what I'm doing. I say, hey, you know, rather than um, rather than start with the entire project, let's do just this first part, and I'll try and break down like a small project, you know, something that's sub one thousand dollars and will take me less than a day, you know, like ideally a five hundred dollar project, and I tell them flat out, I'm like, let's look at this as our first date project. You know, this is us getting coffee, and then that way we'll know if we work well together. And if we do, then we can move on um, to, you know, phase two, three, four of those projects. And when you phrase it like that and you're upfront like that, people really respect it because everyone is risk averse. And that's what you're doing. You're reducing risk for yourself, but you're also reducing risk for the client. Kurt, I, there's sort of a, um, I know from my own experience, there's sort of like a, a desire to get the, the big score right out of the gate with a new client. Like you, you want to get all the money <laughs> all up front that you're ever going to get. Was that a temptation for you or was that something you had to learn? I to lived with? that. We, you know, initially before niching down to Shopify and discovering that smaller projects were better, we went after creative agencies as partners and did uh, projects for creative agencies. And oftentimes we'd find out to like, you know, we'd sell an entire WordPress design development implementation project, you know, for $50,000, get paid for it, and then, you know, have that project go off the rails through, you know, one of any number of reasons, because it's like a six-month-long project. The longer the project is, the more likely it is that, and the more moving pieces there are, the more likely it is to fail. But you're already committed to it. I mean, because you sold the whole project, you signed the contract, you locked them into it, got your payment, it's either give them their money back and lose that time, or, you know, just fight your way through it and not, like, going to work anymore. Um, so that's part of, you know, I prefer smaller projects, smaller, shorter, faster projects in general, because even if they are terrible, you know, I could still, I know, like, hey, here's the deadline, all we have to do is get through it for the next week and then, you know, quietly disengage from that client. It's a lot harder for scope creep to sneak into small projects than it is. That's true, too. Large ones. Uh, yeah, Jeremy, I know you deal with, like, massively complex projects sometimes, and I'm, I'm curious what you've learned from that about, you know, vetting clients before the fact, before there's a, before they've hired you. Um, you know, do the best you can, like, like Kurt and Travis has said, you know, doing some sort of small starter project is really good. Um, if you can get people to buy into that, uh, sometimes people don't because they think their their deadline is too tight, or you know, they a lot of people for whatever reason see road mapping sessions and stuff like that kind of as a waste of money. They don't understand. The, the goal of doing those projects and you know I, I think that's probably on me for not educating them well enough about 
Why well, I've ran into that, that too before, and the solution is to say, like, is to be upfront and say, this is so we see well if we can work together, and that cute phrase, a first date project, people tend to respond to that. The other thing is, you, you know, we always use roadmap as the example. You don't have to necessarily sell roadmap. Um, I've just been doing um, either paid calls or, like, a tiny maintenance development project mm -hmm. as my, my first date project um, to see how things work together. Interesting. So here's a question for, for the group. If if you could go back, to, what would the, the you of you two, two years ago, <laughs> you know, the you two years ago, what would they be most surprised about the you of now in terms of how you now bring on new clients? What would be the biggest surprise for that two-year-old version of you? I, I would say, you know, two years ago for us, we were more just kind of much more general uh, in what we offered, you know, just kind of WordPress design development. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I think uh, being more specific is, is really valuable. And um, definitely had much more of a, um, you know, a, a scarcity mindset where if a lead comes in, it's not, is this a good fit for our business? It's how can we win this project? Um, you know, that, that was more of our uh, approach was, okay, what can we do to make sure that we win this project and uh, get whatever money we can out of this? Like Kurt was saying, you know, there's this temptation to, um, to go after all the money up front. And I, I think that's a, an abundance versus scarcity mindset thing too of, um, you know, just how can we make this as big as we can and, um, you know, get, get all the money we can versus what's absolute best for this client and the highest ROI because that's going to result in the, you know, the the most satisfied client, you know, on on their side, and then lead to more, you know, recurring revenue, or you know, they're going to come back to you, stuff like that. Um, so that's for me, that's probably the, the thing now is that I'm not looking at, okay, how can I win this project? It's, am I really the best thing for them right now? And um, you know, and do I do I actually want to work with these people? It's just being a lot more picky and selective. Yeah, once I made that mindset shift from, you know, freelancer to consultant to business owner, I, like, that is its own uh, toolbox of things that goes along with it. Um, and I agree with everything Travis said, but probably, like, for me personally, just as a human being, I am amazed. The me of two years ago would would not believe how assertive I've become as a result. You know, being able to say, essentially, you know, set my expectations for the client as opposed to the other way around. You know, ditching that, like, the customer's always right mentality that is fine for retail, but not fine for um, a real professional consultant, expert authority, what have you. Um, but, yeah, I mean, learn just simple things. Learning when and how to say no. Not feeling guilty about turning down work that doesn't make you happy. You don't have to do what people tell you to do. Just build the business for the life you want. Yeah, one of the things that I think I'd be surprised about a couple of years ago is turning down work that is, you know, ostensibly in my wheelhouse, but not exactly. Um, you know, for a long time I was, you know, kind of like Travis said, a, a journalist and anything that was even remotely related to my area of expertise, I would try to take that on. And even if it was a little outside my area of expertise, you know, I would tell the client, hey, I can figure this out and I'll get it done for you. Uh, but now I'm, you know, my first option there is going to tell them, look, I could probably figure this out, but I know that there are people out there that know this material better than I do and that would, yes, they might charge you a higher hourly rate, but they're going to get it done in many fewer hours than I would and you're going to get the best bang for your buck by going that route. Um, and that's definitely something I wouldn't have done a couple of years ago. And I found that that really uh, creates a lot of trust with people. Uh, I've had people that I've told that to that have then followed that up with, oh, well, we would really like to work with you. Can you tell us what your core area of expertise is so that we can try to find something that's going to fit for you? And, you know, that's... Yeah, that's interesting. The um. Thing. <laughs> yeah, there, well, there's two things there. Like, people expect to be pitched and they expect you to grovel. So when you flip it on its head and you... Like, the most powerful negotiation tactic you have is getting up and walking away from the table. And that's functionally what you did. And then the second thing is we know, like, human psychology, if you 
it's a, if you open a relationship by saying something negative about yourself, which is, I'm not the best fit for this, automatically they're going to trust everything you say after that. Because you were open and honest. Like, you said, no, I can't, I, I don't want your money. Yep. I think, I think the Kai of two years ago would be most surprised about how... Not quick, but how comfortable I am with firing a client or saying, you know what, this project isn't working out, this relationship isn't as positive as I'd like it to be, I think we need to part ways here and now. That two years ago it very much was, to echo what everybody else has said, a scarcity mindset where I was eager to work with anybody who came through the door, very excited for their money and only focused on how I could win that project. Now I'm much more focused on, well, is this client bringing me joy? Is this a project I enjoy working on? Is this something where I'm excited to contribute? And if I'm not, or the client and I don't have a positive relationship, I'm, I'm the first one to say, you know what? I think we should terminate the relationship. And it really does flip the power script with a client when you say, hey, you know what? You've been paying me X thousands of dollars a month we're going to end here. They're like, wait, what? no, but I'm, I'm paying you. You can't say that. But as a consultant, we are empowered to say, you know what, this isn't a fit. This isn't a good match. I'd much rather we part ways and you know have a good handshake and say we did the best we could. I would per I'm personally surprised at how our services have evolved over the last two years. And just thinking about it now, I'm looking back at the the projects that we worked on, the clients we worked with that were really good fit, that were really healthy relationship, and those were the ones that that where we sort of found those um, those services, those things that we could do for companies because they were trusting of us. They gave us the room to be able to sort of explore these new strategies and you know kind of play around with those ideas, and they've evolved into these uh, services that we offer all the time now. And that's just another thing that when you have that client that's a right fit, the right fit, uh, it's just better for your business because it, you just have that sort of extra energy and that extra freedom to be able to kind of explore these other other ways of of helping their business out. That maybe a a real you know a client that just wants to move your hands around or who's who has their own mindset of how things should run. Uh, probably wouldn't give you that that long of a leash to be able to do that. So I feel like um, our our business has evolved in a really good way because of these projects that went really well. Nice. Well, I'm hearing you all in one way or another say um, you're doing things you just could not have imagined two years ago that are about becoming much more selective and saying no and uh, sort of forcing clients to step out of sight of their own um, expectation about how they're going to relate to you. And uh, so, Kai, you mentioned um, sometimes parting ways with a client, so I'd like to shift gears and talk about that. Because uh, for a lot of us, that's sort of the painful flip side of starting a relationship is ending a relationship with a client. I mean, maybe you still keep in touch with them, but you're not taking their money and doing things for them anymore. So... Um, what, uh, you know, what's, I guess, in the theme of the biggest surprise, what's kind of been the biggest surprise as you've all become more comfortable with that and, and had to face it and figure out better ways to do it? Uh, it's not as bad as I imagined it would be. Uh, I fired a client for the first time earlier this year and ended up giving them a large refund along with it just because their vision of what was going to happen had diverged so far from mine that it, there was just no way to wrap up the project on mutually agreeable terms without me just, you know, giving them everything they want and doing weeks of work for free. Um, and I was really nervous about it and, you know, really stressed out. And then when it finally happened and I gave them the money, I felt so much better. Uh, just the, the release of stress was worth every bit of money that I didn't make on that project. <laughs> is is there a time when you would have toughed that out, Jeremy? I'm curious. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, I mean, as as recently as last year, I would have just put my head down and gritted my teeth and done everything I could to get through it, and it would have turned into a four-month struggle, and I would have hated life for a while. And 
Yeah, so, I mean, what changed? Why, why did you not repeat that pattern? Um, I think just the realization that there are plenty of clients out there. You know, it's not like Travis said, I, I think I had a scarcity mindset at one point where every single thing that ever crossed my path, I thought, ooh, I've got to get that client, and I'm going to get that one, and then, you know, I've have realized that, oh, man, there's hundreds of companies out there that need help from somebody that does exactly what I do, and I can go find more of those companies, and when I get bogged down in a mess, you know, there's there's nothing that says I have to, to go through that, you know, I haven't taken an oath to help that client or anything, you know, it's, we're doing business here, and if if it's not mutually beneficial, then just cut it off. Yeah, and, and to, to piggyback on that, you know, that, that can be really scary, that sort of, um, you know, either whether that's saying no to someone up front or firing a client, you know, because you, you do have that feeling. Um, I know a lot of people do because I used to of like, well, what if, what if I don't take this project? Like, what's next? Where is it coming from? Um, and that, so that's, that's a legitimate real feeling, but it's, I think it's important to remember. And, you know, yeah, if you're like, you know, the the cupboard is bare, then yeah, take the you know take the project, um, do what you need to to feed yourself and your family. But it's Im it's important to remember that if you take that thing that's a, a terrible fit and maybe you know you're not going to make much profit on and that you're going to ha have yourself hating work, then you're booked up now and you can't take that awesome project that's going to come in two weeks from now that's a perfect fit that could turn into like this you know really long awesome client relationship um, so you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot uh, because you're 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 really limiting your opportunities if you're taking all these projects that are bad fits um, so there's a there's kind of a hidden benefit there of, of saying no is not just getting that bad thing off your plate but of opening yourself up to, to the good opportunities that are going to come in the door next week yeah and so Travis just touched on two things that I think helped me a lot in getting to that point and one was my cupboard wasn't bare I had been working with some good clients over an extended period of time and had a good amount of savings so I wasn't just hurting for work and feeling like you know I needed every dollar that I could bring in the door uh, and then I did have some you know a pipeline of leads that were hanging out there that you know I I knew that I wasn't being able to get to those people because I was stuck with this bad client that I was working with. Uh, and so those two things put together, you know, were definitely help in uh, getting over that that hump in my mind about, you know, oh, I, I can't turn down work, I can't fire a client, I can't give somebody a refund. Um, you know, just not being in dire financial straits uh, helps a lot. One thing I'd like to add is for a consultant who's starting out and doesn't have that, doesn't have the fortune of having a solid pipeline established or a large war chest, it might be an iterative process where you start out accepting projects that eh, might not be a 100% fit for you. You're doing some qualification, but you don't have 100% perfect standards. As you build up that pipeline, as you build up that reserve of work, as you build up that war chest, you're able to be more selective and more exclusive. The benefit of being book solid is now you're able to say no to the clients or prospects that aren't a good fit, and you have the capacity to say, I'd love to work with you. You're a perfect fit for me. The first opening on my calendar is in two months. If you'd like, we can make a payment today and reserve the time for that project. And suddenly, you're able to, to level up over six months, a year, two years into accepting any comers to being exclusive, being a professional, and being somebody who's in such demand that you literally have a waiting list. Yeah, that really helps when it comes time to make that difficult decision to fire a client. I am curious if, uh, I, I would guarantee if I asked, have we done it all done it the wrong way, everybody would raise their hand. Have we fired a client in a way that was unnecessarily harsh or reactionary or what have you. Uh, but I guess I'm more interested in whether folks have discovered ways to end client relationships that are better, like markedly better than what you did before. Sure. So there's a couple ways. Um, I mean, part of it is going to be your tone, how you approach it. So if you're really, you know, def you don't want to be defensive, I try to almost make it casual um, and I make it clear that what I'm doing is in their best interest. So ideally you want to do it, you also, and it's about timing. So if the project just started 
and I'm like, okay, my gut check was wrong, these are not the right fit, then right up front I tell people, I said, hey, now that I've um, been able to submerge myself completely in this project, um, I realize I'm not going to be able to complete it um, you know, the, in a way that would in a way that would make both of us happy, that would meet both of our expectations. So what I've done is I've already refunded your payment, your deposit payment entirely, and I don't want, you know, I'd love to support you in a different way, so here are two other consultants who should be able to help you with your project. You know, again, I apologize. I realize that this is um, frustrating for you, but um, this is better, you know, it's better to be frustrated now than to have a disappointing result that neither of us are happy with later. And then there's no way you can really argue with that. It's like, yeah, he's right. You know, it's annoying, but he's right. And then, of course, um, is to look for good timing to finish it. So if it's like a monthly retainer project, you just let the person know, hey, this is going to be the last month we're working together. I'm no longer, I mean, you, you could say, like, I'm no longer doing this type of work without making it about them. Um, and then just, you know, quietly let that, that engagement end. But it's only, like, it's not a bad thing. I mean, if you can refer them to someone who's going to be better, you help them. And that's the mindset you have to adopt. I've used that line about, um, you know, it's better now, better to be a little bit frustrated now than disappointed with that end result. Plenty of times, and sometimes I use that even, you know, for if it's just, hey, we're not going to take this project on at all before we've even started. And any any client who has hired uh, any kind of freelancer or consultant, you know, been doing this for a little while, um, they've been around the block and they've been through that situation where they've had that disappointing end result. And so they know you're, like Kurt said, you're 100% right. And they, like, I've had people thank me for saying that because they know, like, they've been there, done that, had that, you know, freelancer, whoever, who just toughed it out and gave them a crappy product. And they're like, oh, thank you for not, you know, going, putting us through that again. Because a lot of times they came to us because they've been put through that. And so they don't want to, you know, get on that merry-go-round again. So they'd much rather know up front. So, I've yeah. had that experience, yeah, where they thank me. Literally, the only, like, the handful of times where they didn't, I mean, all that does is reaffirm that I made the right decision. Uh, one thing I've learned is you can never have too much communication when it comes to uh, uh, any sort of client interaction. If you think you're over-communicating, if you think you're talking too much, you're at the right level since the more communication you give in that project, the easier it will be for the client to understand what's going on and the easier it will be for you to separate at the end. If you're able to say like, hey, listen, this is what the situation is. This is why we're going to part ways. I'm not doing this type of work anymore. It's going to come off better than at the end of the month we're just done or letting the project just lapse into obscurity. More communication is better. Yeah, I think the, the cornerstone of any relationship, whether it's like with your spouse or with a client, is open and honest communication. You know, one of the sort of paradoxical aspects I'm picking up on here is for those of us, uh, and I'm raising my hand here, who don't like conflict, um, having those little small discussions that trigger the con fear of con conflict fear are actually much better because if you do have to fire a client, it's just almost a non-event. It's like, well, it just it makes sense to you. It makes sense to them because they're not learning about these things for the first time. And, uh, and it's just the next natural step in the relationship. And it probably means that the relationship after you're not working together will be one where they are referring you or um, think positively of your actions because of how you conducted yourself. Another thing that's interesting that I'm hearing you all say is having the ability to refer a, a client that you're just firing or you decided not to hire is uh, a part of the process and that maybe should be something people include in their tool belt, right, is some relationships that uh, they can refer bad fit clients to or, uh, or clients, you know, that they're about to fire. I've just started keeping a little uh, black book spreadsheet where it's just like consultant name, profession, contact information. And so if somebody comes to me and I'm book solid or I need to refer a bad fit, I'm able to say, oh, they need SEO services. Great, I got, I got three people on my list here. Hey, you should contact Jim, Jeanette, and Jane. They're all going to be wonderful at helping you with your project. And it makes it easier than me spontaneously thinking of. Since like, if you ask me right now, who do you know that could do graphic design? I'd stutter for a couple seconds. Just as I meet fellow freelancers and fellow consultants, Keeping them in a Rolodex, keeping them in a spreadsheet makes it so easy when I need to refer somebody to someone. 
Sometimes the referrals can be tricky, though, because, you know, you have a prospect that you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy, uh, and then, you know, it's hard to come up with somebody that you actually want to refer them to. That's that's when I say, uh, you know, I'd love to refer to you, you to somebody, and I don't know somebody who would be a, the right fit for yeah. your project. Yeah. And I don't say that the reason they're not the right fit is because I like them, and I don't want to put them through that. <laughs> yeah. But that's that's a reason that they're not a fit. So, yeah, totally. I've used a very similar script saying, like, I, I'd love you to refer you to somebody. I'm not the right fit for this project. Unfortunately, I don't know of a consultant who has availability right now. But as soon as I encounter somebody that is a good fit, I'll connect you with them. I might not ever close that loop, but I'm at least trying to give the presentation, give the uh, presumption that I am on their side of the table. So we've got five minutes to wrap up. Um, parting thoughts on any of these subjects, hiring, firing, you know, dealing with the beginning and the end of client relationships. Yeah, I've, I've got just a little anecdote. You know, we talked about not taking on people who you can't help, who aren't a good fit. Um, I just got an email late last night from someone who I talked to, I think, back in July, and, you know, we looked at, at possibly moving forward on a project, but it was just, it just wasn't going to work. Uh, I, I liked them a lot, but the, the technical you know, reasons were, were too complex. And I got an email from them last night saying that they were working with the person I'd referred them to. It was going great, and they wanted to send me money as a thank you for, you know, the time that I did spend talking to them. Um, so I just wanted to share that little story as like a, and I said, no, you know, don't send me any money, just refer people to me. Um, but, you know, that they were that grateful for, you know, have us having said, we're not the best person to do this right now, and you should go talk to so-and-so. And that worked out really well for them, and that's how thankful they were that months later they come back saying, please let us give you money. So, You said no? <laughs> well, they, they offered $200. So, yeah. I said, no, no, the best, the best thing you can do is just to, to send all your friends to us. So. Well, and of course, you know, it's... Nothing, uh, nothing comes for free. As soon as you've accepted money from that, you know, that bad fit client, now suddenly you owe them something. So you'll, at the very least, get like, they'll expect that as they get to email you for the rest of forever random questions. So I think you were right to turn it down. Yeah, and now I'm in that position of having said, you know, been overly generous, you know. So yeah, I, I was, but I was just, I just laughed because I hadn't heard from them in months. And like I said, I liked them a lot, but. You know, it was it was amusing. So, but it perfectly timed with this conversation. Anyone else? I mean, I would well, just acknowledge um, that this is a really hard thing to do. Um, it's just, especially if you don't have a lot coming in right now, and so it's just something you really have to believe is the best thing for your business, and um, that you just have to try and and see how it goes. Yeah. yeah, and if you're that you scared, to... your feelings are totally valid, but just give it a shot, and you'll it'll get easier. And as soon as you start seeing those little wins, it it, it well it won't become easier. It'll become the way you do business. Yeah, and, and it's not an overnight transition. You know, you can do this a little bit at a time. Don't feel like you have to just throw out everything you've been doing, but just you can level up a little bit at a time. But it's important to start making those steps because the next one gets easier. Yeah, thinking of it as firing the bottom 10% of your clients once every three, six, or 12 months, over time you're going to level up your business to people where you're like, I don't want to fire any of these people. I love all of them. I, I can't let any of them go. But when you're starting out, just saying like, okay, I might have like five clients I work with at a time. Which one of these can I let go that isn't a good fit that frees me up for the next good project? Yep. To our listeners, thank you. Wants. Yeah, thanks. Panelists, thank you. This was awesome. Uh, to our listeners, thank you as well. Um, more information on this content, however it ended up in your hands, is available at independentconsultingmanual.com. And uh, panelists, I think, are uh, happy to help in any way that their uh, busy schedule allows. Um, so you can reach out to folks directly as well. And I'm going to hit the stop uh, recording button here.